Well, as we come before the living God, the God who speaks, let's bow to him in our uh, prayers and to ask for his grace in our lives. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the God of truth. You are a God who prizes integrity and goodness. And Father, we thank you that you prize it so much that in your word you warn us against hypocrisy. And you also give us wonderful models of generosity, gospel generosity. And so we pray this morning, Lord, as we turn to that word, you would work it in our hearts that we reflect more and more the goodness and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, it was as if the entire world was holding its breath for four agonizing days, hoping, praying for some kind of miracle to bring back the three American astronauts who were stranded in the very fragile, tiny Apollo 13 capsule some 210,000 miles from Earth. And all it took was some faulty wiring to bring the whole enterprise to the brink of destruction. And this is how it was depicted in the film. Well, between Jack's back taxes and the Fred Hayes show, I'd say that was a pretty successful broadcast. That's an excellent show, Austin. Thank you very much, Houston. Uh, we got a couple of housekeeping procedures for you. We'd like you to roll right to zero, six, zero, and null your rates. Roger that. Rolling right, zero, six, zero. And then if you could uh, give your oxygen tanks a stir. Roger that. the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Words which have been immortalized and which probably is one of the greatest understatements of all time. However, what was a disaster in the making was avoided by taking some very drastic and ingenious steps to solve the problem. And the result was that the astronauts and the Apollo 13 and the whole Apollo program was actually saved. And you know, something very similar took place in the life of the early church. The church was launched into orbit, as it were, on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel. And what a spectacular launch it was, with over 3,000 people being added to Christ's kingdom. Lives were transformed, the gospel spread, opposition was experienced, but still God's mission knew no bounds. And that is when a few faulty wires threatened to bring it down to earth with a crash. And we read all about it in Acts chapter 5, and the terrifying story of Ananias and Sapphira. But the backdrop to this sorry episode appears at the end of chapter 4, which is a delightful devotion. Look at uh, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone 
who had need. Now, I don't know about you, but I guess that if I had been written, writing this passage, which is a cameo of the early church, I would have followed up verse 32 with verse 33b, so that it read like this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Now, that would seem to logically follow on from the generosity of the first Christians, doesn't it? No one lacked anything because they were so generous. But instead, Luke shoehorns in between the description of what the apostles were doing. With great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So it's as if the resurrection life of the church community somehow feeds the proclamation of the gospel of the resurrection by the apostles. In other words, it's all of a piece. There's a complete integrity between what the apostles proclaimed and the life the church practiced, the manner of life giving credence to the message of life. The implication being that if the Christians didn't produce the resurrection goods, for example, by the way they sat loose to their own possessions, seeing them not as their own, but belonging to God and so to each other, then the power of the proclamation of the gospel would somehow be reduced or even lost. Now, as we shall see, this, is in, this in part explains the drastic demise of Ananias and Sapphira in the next chapter. The importance of the Christian community walking the walk, thus enabling them to talk the talk, can't be overstressed. There's a lovely story of the medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas who was being taken around the Vatican. And uh, as the guide uh, pointed out all these beautiful treasures, he boastfully commented to Aquinas, the church no longer has to say, silver and gold have I none. To which Aquinas responded, yes, but neither can the church say to the lame, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, history bears testament to the fact that the church has had the greatest impact on unbelievers when it has shown the kind of generosity to the needy that God has shown in sending his son into the world to meet our greatest need. And that's what we see happening here in spades. They no more clung onto what they owned any more than the Son of God clung on to what was his by right in heaven. He put aside all those things to meet our need. And so his followers are simply doing the same. And let me tell you this. Any church which takes this as a template for its Christian living can't help but be noticed in a society like ours a society which is simply gripped by materialism. It's all part of our fallen nature to want to possess things under the delusion that the more we have, the more we can be in control of our lives. But of course, all it takes is a virus to reveal what a shallow delusion that is. Within a matter of months, businesses are closed livelihoods are ruined, lives are taken, and futures, futures rendered uncertain, and especially amongst the young. And it's into this kind of situation that the gospel of generosity speaks so powerfully and so eloquently. The idea of establishing a family fund and the collection of items to distribute to those in need here at Christchurch I think is a wonderful 21st century equivalent to what we see happening here in the book of Acts. For the members of Christ Church to be of one heart 
and one mind. That this fund is filled to overflowing together with the collection points will be nothing short of a demonstration of the kind of grace, God's grace, that Luke speaks of in verse 33. But do you know what else will happen? The word of the gospel will go out with power. Now just think about this. If Luke is describing what several thousand Christians are doing in Jerusalem following Pentecost, then someone has to be pretty remarkable to stand out to gain the attention of the apostles and the rest of the church. But that is what happens in verse 36. There is such a man from Cyprus who is called Joseph. And he is so full of generosity and kindness, so busy liquidizing his assets to release cash in order to give it away, that he's noticed and is even given a nickname to sum up his character, Barnabas, son of encouragement. It can also be translated son of exhortation, the son of a preacher man. Now, Joseph was a, a bog-standard name at the time. It was a very common name. But this fellow was so outstanding that he gained a well-deserved reputation of being the kind of Christian you just want to be with. The kind of Christian who is bound to make you feel good for simply having been in his presence. Do, do you know the kind of person I mean? And so it will come as no surprise that later on in the book of Acts that it is Barnabas who becomes one of the key missionaries in the spread of the gospel. So again, you've got that link between living the gospel in resurrection power and proclaiming the gospel of the resurrection in power. Now, in many ways, the, this, this description of Barnabas sets us up and acts as a kind of foil for what we read next regarding Ananias and Sapphira and a dangerous deceit. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, what's going on? Well, it's not simply a matter of greed. Because as Peter says in verse 4, they had every right to sell the property, which was theirs after all. This is not an example of early communism, as some people suggest. And therefore, to keep the proceeds. There was nothing wrong in doing that. So greed doesn't seem to be one of these seven deadly sins in operation here. But given the close proximity of the description of Barnabas having gained a reputation for being generous, and the wording in verse 37 being similar to that of chapter 5, verse 1, there was in all probability two of the other deadly sins at work in their lives. Jealousy and pride. You see, why couldn't these two have a bit of the limelight shine on them, like Barnabas, so they could stand out amongst the crowd? They too wanted a, a reputation for generosity. But whereas Barnabas' reputation was deserved, their hopeful reputation was based on deceit. And that this was no momentary moral lapse on the part of Ananias, but a deliberate plan to embezzle God, and that is the word used in verse 2, embezzle, that's underscored by the fact that he had discussed this with his wife. And together they agreed to do it. This is premeditated. Planning to cheat God, not just cheating people. 
And this is what Peter spells out in verses 3 and 4. Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? It's a devilish thing they've done. The serpent, Satan, has been at work. It's almost as if there's an echo of what happened in Eden with Adam and Eve when they decided they would do what they wanted to gain power, prestige. Now, we really, really must grasp, try and grasp the seriousness of this. You know, it's only too possible to be a professing believer, even a real believer. There's no indication in the text that Ananias and Sapphira weren't converted and yet be willing to throw away the integrity of our faith for the sake of a false reputation. They wanted the reputation, but without the reality, the reality of sacrifice. Now, we hear a lot today about fake news. But there's also such a thing as fake faith. Not that someone doesn't have saving faith, but rather the faith they present to those around them isn't authentic. It's, it's all show. Now, let me tell you something. The most beguiling hypocrisy of all is evangelical hypocrisy. This is the model Christian couple who puts on the smile on a Sunday, but whose home life is one of misery and abuse. It's the church member who loves to make all the pious statements in the Bible study, who speaks so much about mission and evangelism, but would be the last person in the world to lift a finger to do anything about them. It's the man or woman who loves pride of place in being on all the committees, being looked up to as the elder statesperson, who gives large checks to the treasurer and seems so impressive with the long, earnest prayers of the prayer meeting. And yet, and yet for all of this, if the truth be known, it is but a pious mass worn to hide the spiritual barrenness of their own souls. Now, let me ask, is that you? Or is it a danger you're, you're facing? You want to be well thought of. You want to be looked up to by others in the church and especially the church leadership. But you know that what you're saying and what you're doing doesn't ring true. Oh, yes, your evangelical credentials seem impeccable. After all, you belong to Christ Church Newland. You sit under good Bible teaching every week. But if that is not translated into genuine generosity, costly sacrifice, with the inner spirit matching the outward action, then now might be a good time to get your soul sorted with God. And to do that before it's too late. And tragically, that is what it proved to be for this couple. Too late. Hence, a divine discipline. Verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. And that's it. Not much of a funeral. Out of the house, into the grave. And the same with the wife, verse 10. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. 
So some gift day this was. And people talk about being slain in the spirit. Now, friends, this episode occurring right near the beginning of the life of the church is recorded for a good reason. Namely, as a stark warning to us all. Verse 11. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And maybe this put the mockers on evangelism for a while at least because we read in verse 12 that although the apostles performed signs and wonders, that is amazing miracles, no one else dared join them. Well, would you? Knowing that the God these people worshipped, the Jesus these people proclaimed as Lord, the Holy Spirit who was at work amongst them could take our behavior so seriously that if you trifle with this God, he could take you out just like that. And although this is a striking example of divine discipline in the church, it wasn't unique. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, we read in verses 29 and following, that some of the believers in that church were being struck down with illness and that some of them had even died. And why? Well, because they were not behaving properly at Holy Communion. And Paul states quite explicitly that this is God exercising discipline for a purpose. We are judged in this way by the Lord. We are being disciplined, he says, so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. Now, can you see why this discipline is so severe? Nothing less than the life and future of the church is at stake. Now, what do I mean? Well, we've already seen that at the end of chapter 4, Luke links the purity of the church with the progress of the gospel. A people of one heart and one mind is the kind of purity that God is calling his people to, to be full of love and generosity. That is gospel purity. It's not a nebulous thing, it's practical an outflowing of the grace of God in our lives. And then, of course, it goes out in the proclamation with the gospel in power. But just supposing Ananias and Sapphira had been allowed to get away with their cheating, then what? You see, at this stage, no one else knew about it, except the Holy Spirit, who'd obviously revealed it to Peter. But of course, it would only be a matter of time before someone did get to know and the word got round. And do you think it would have been a one-off? It would have been left there? Supposing they'd gained a reputation like Barnabas, and they too eventually uh, came into a position of influence and leadership in the church, then what? Well, not only would there be moral compromise within the church, the weakening of the moral fiber of other believers until the whole church is hardly distinguishable from the world which is to be condemned. That is Paul's point. But unbelievers would have been justified in dismissing this church as a sect full of hypocrites, being as consumed with reputation and status just like everybody else. But furthermore, God's reputation would have been tarnished as being morally, morally lax and far from holy. Therefore, he had to act, in the words of the Old Testament, for his name's sake. God, in his mercy, acts so decisively and so dramatically in order to cut out the cancer before it grows any further. And you know, if Ananias and Sapphira were truly converted, then their death could have been a mercy to them. 
Because otherwise, with time, they could have gone on further down the road with Satan until eventually they were lost altogether. I remember a, a pastor friend uh, of mine saying to me when a, a well-known evangelical minister had decided to leave his wife, family, and the church to enter into a homosexual relationship with a man. He said to me, Melvin, don't you think you'd rather be run down by a bus than to allow that to happen? And he was right. Just as drastic steps had to be taken with the Apollo 13 crew to get them home and the space program back on course, even though the initial cause of the potential disaster seemed so small, a few faulty wires. So important is the purity of the church that God will do whatever it takes to keep it pure. Shall we pray? Our dear Father, we bow before you. First of all, we ask for your forgiveness for the way in which we do diminish your reputation by our lives, by the way we make, we belittle those things which you consider to be important. And Father, we know how deceit lurks so closely in our minds and in our hearts. And given an opportunity, will flourish and will grip us. And Lord, will deceive us as well as deceive others. And Father, we pray against that. Lord, no matter how small the deceit or the temptation to deceit in our lives, Lord, we would want to repent of those things. And we pray, Lord, for Christ Church that we will be a church of overwhelming generosity where what is seen matches what is really on the inside. And Lord, we will see many, many, many people, boys and girls, come to a saving knowledge of Christ, that people will be liberated and freed from the grip of materialism and come into the liberty and the love and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.